and welcome back. Like I said, I was going to jump into part two of this book, um, Decoding the Antichrist by Mark Biltz. Um, I got it wrong. The, the first video I said Blitz, it's actually Biltz. So that's my bad. My apologies. Um, I am going to make part two right now, but before I do that, I need to tell you a God moment that literally just happened right now. In my previous video, I said that my niece Autumn was talking about a book that her and I got thrift shopping um, like a year ago. I couldn't remember the title of the book. I knew what the cover looked like, but I couldn't remember the title. I couldn't remember who wrote it. And I knew that I'd had it a few weeks ago because I was putting it away from a box that had a few other things in it and I was doing some reorganizing. So I knew that I had it and I could not find it. I checked my little library I have in my room where all my books are stored. I checked my mom's where all of her books are downstairs. And I checked a few other places and then I checked my room again and I could not find it. I was so mad. I was talking with my mom and my sister and I was like, I swear the enemy is hiding this book from me. And I don't, I don't understand why. I said, I think it's because there's some stuff in here that the enemy doesn't want me to share and he's hiding it from me so I can't find it. And so earlier in the day, probably like four o'clock for reference, it's almost nine o'clock PM right now. Um, I said a prayer and I'm like, God, please show me this book. So then I just finished that first part one video of that book. I did a quick edit, I hit upload, and I went to go make myself some tea while it was exporting, here it is. And I said, you know what? While the water's on, let me go check my books one more time because I know I have this book. So I go in there, I checked a few other places first because I'm like, maybe I put it here, maybe I put it there. It wasn't any of those places. So I cleared off my rocking chair because I'm short and my bookshelf is like over my head. And so I'm like, let me get on a chair so I can look to see if maybe like it fell behind. So I start moving some of these books, like pulling them down, looking behind them and it's not there. So then I happen to like read the titles of a few of my books. I found it. Well, God showed it to me, actually. That's what this whole thing is about. This is the book, and I finally found it. It's called Prophecies Concealed, Now Revealed by Perry Stone. I read, so you'll probably hear that throughout my videos. Tonight. It's my sump pump, and it's raining outside, so it's going to just go. So I apologize. You'll hear that. This is the book, and I cannot believe that I checked that place three times and now I finally found it. I also found um, a few other books that I brought in with me. The first one is called, there we go, Return of the King. And that one's by Rod Parsley. And this one is called Silent God by Joseph Bentz. You can see the thrifty store tag on there too. Um, and it's called, and the premise of it is finding him when you can't hear his voice. And then Return of the King um, is, I'll read the back of it really quick. It's called, it says, dive in with Dr. Rod Parsley as he maps an indispensable guide through the events unfolding all around us. From a global pandemic to ever increasing division and discord to growing darkness in the minds of multitudes, Dr. Parsley clears the debris of pain and confusion so that biblical significance can surface in the heart of every believer. Don't wait another minute. And it says, you'll learn about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which we'll read about in that prophecies book, the sign of all signs, the abomination of desolation, the mark of the antichrist, the second coming, the purpose of the millennium and more. So that's this book. And then finding him when you can't hear his voice. Um, on the back, it says, God's silence is bewildering, but it doesn't have to be. With an intriguing blend of experience and insight, Joseph Benz explores ways to reduce the noise that keeps us from hearing Christ's presence. So these are two other books that I want to get into anyway. So if you guys want to hear more on either of these books, comment down below so that I know you want to see them and I will start doing uh, videos on these books as well. So you'll be able to see both of these books. I'm going to do this one right now. Well, 
after this video. I'm gonna do this one. And then I'm doing part two of this one right now. And then I need to do part three of the story. And of course, Jesus Calling, I do every night. And those I do in a batch on Sunday. So guys, let me know. I need to know which ones you want more of. So comment down below. So let's jump into um, this one right here. We'll go back right into where we left off. So let's do that. So this is called A Historical Perspective, Chapter 1. I have heard it said that we learn from history that we do not learn. We learn from history that we do not learn from history. I had to read that twice because it confused me. So we learn from history that we do not learn from history. Talk about truth. The other quote that has always struck a chord with me is, history is written by the, written by the winners. Even today, there are many revisionists who want to rewrite history from their own perspective. Each of us becomes personally attached to the versions of events we were taught. I can't help but think of the prophecy in Jeremiah 16 that states, the nations will come from the ends of the earth, saying that their fathers have inherited lies. I have always felt that true believers really want to know what the Bible has to say more than what any individual or denomination has to say. The Bible has to be our foundation. Amen. And now let me take a drink here. Sorry. I had myself so hyped up over that book that I am like major adrenaline right now. And my heart rate is sitting at 88, which is okay, but it should be lower. Um, so I need to collect myself so that I don't fumble over all these words. With that said, we must also realize that the best way to understand any book is by consulting the original language in which it was, uh, it was written. And that's the really cool thing about my aunt Lisa is she can read Hebrew so she can actually read the original text of the Bible. Well, one of them. Um... If you take a piece of literature and translate it from Hebrew to Greek to Spanish to Latin to English, you have to know something, something is going to be lost. When I spoke in Taiwan, I asked where the Chinese got their Bible translation from, and they told me from English. It surprised me that they had not gotten it directly from Hebrew or Greek, which would make more sense in my opinion. Many today believe our media is biased, you think? If that's the case... Isn't it possible the translators were as well? And even if they weren't biased, mistakes could have happened. After all, they were only human and people aren't perfect. Keeping that in mind, let's touch on just a few improperly translated Hebrew words to give us some perspective. Ooh, I'm excited about this. When you think of the English word seasons, what do you think of? What comes to mind when you think of the word feast? Did you know both of these English words come from the same Hebrew word? I did not. How can the Hebrew word that means winter, spring, summer, or fall also mean a lot of food? This is what happened in Genesis 1.14 when it says God created the sun and moon for seasons. And in Leviticus 23 when the same word translated as the feasts of the Lord. A more accurate translation into English for both would be appointed times. This is directly referring to God's calendar. Oh my gosh, Lisa talks about God's calendar all the time. I had a calendar of God's calendar last year and I need another one. The Islamic religion has its appointed times based solely on the moon. The Christian calendar comes from Roman times and Christian religious holidays are based solely on the sun. The biblical calendar, as stated in Genesis, was to be based on both the sun and the moon. This is why the holidays God told Moses to celebrate were based on both the sun and the moon. Both the sun and the moon were to be God's witnesses in heaven. God has a daily planner, so to speak, and both Moses and David had to do everything according to the pattern given to them by the Spirit. They were to celebrate specific events during specific days months, and years according to God's calendar. Over and over, it was stated that everything had to be done according to the pattern. I believe it is wise for us to follow the pattern that God has laid out. We must remember that God states there is nothing new under the sun. 
History will repeat itself, but from different vantage points, in the hope that humanity in general, and each of us in particular, will finally understand what God is trying to teach us. Could you imagine how frustrating it must be to be God? We must be... I would be so frustrated. It's like we're children that can't figure out how to survive, pretty much. Each one of God's feasts was a pattern of what would happen prophetically, not only to the day, but also to the very hour of what was to come. In Revelation, it states, the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. That means Passover was planned from creation. The Father predetermined what day his son was going to die, what hour he would pass, even what songs were to be sung at his funeral. This is incredible. Why do you think the Messiah died on Passover? Why was he bound to the cross at the time of the morning sacrifice? Why did he die at the time of the evening sacrifice? Why did God have King David write Psalm 113 through 118, 1,000 years earlier, and caused them to be the very hymns that were sung three times every Passover? God sets the pattern, and that is why everything about Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven follows the timing of the spring feasts. Messiah died on Passover. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He rose on the Feast of First Fruits, and the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, feasts, on the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Everything happened according to the pattern. I believe that in the very same way, the events predicted for the end times will happen according to the pattern of the fall feasts to the very days. I am not setting dates as we have no idea what year, but if you don't recognize the pattern, there is a good chance you will be caught unaware as to when and how they will unfold. You know what it is like when a gear is missing or broken to is missing or broken tooth because the church has been operating on the wrong calendar for 2,000 years. We no longer see the pattern. That is so true. We have lost. The church is so lost. There are so many lost churches out there. I am so blessed that my church has such a wonderful pastor, Pastor Les. He, he does not put his own interpretation on the Bible. His sermons are strictly what the word says. No interpretation, no spin, no, well, I think this. There's none of that. It's just cut and dry. Excuse me, cut and dry. I like cut and dry. I'm a cut and dry kind of person, and so it's perfect for me. And I I can trust what he says because it's backed up with scripture. It's, it's, biblical it's scriptural i mean there is no interpretation there is no well i think that it could be this and maybe we should interpret it this way there's none of that so with that being said when you're in church ask yourself if what you're hearing is scriptural is biblical, if it's something that is interpreted or has their own particular feeling put on it, and be honest with yourself. Um, And if, if you question it, then do some research. If you're sure that it's teaching you incorrectly, find a new church home. It's okay to start over. My family had to start over. I was... 17, 16, 17, when we went to a different church and we'd gone to the same one my whole life and a little history about me, the church that we went to, my family actually started way back in the day. So it was not only my church home, but my family going back generations church home. So it's okay to start over if things are not right. So just be honest with yourself. It's hard. I know it's hard, but be honest with yourself. All right, <clears throat> continuing on. Uh, I believe that the very same way the events predicted for the end times will happen according to the fall feast to the very days. Okay, I read that already, but we're going to keep going. 
I am not setting dates as we have no idea what year, but if you don't recognize the pattern, there's a good chance you will be caught unaware as to when and how they will unfold. Okay. We no longer see the pattern. Did you know that a few years ago, Easter was celebrated a month before Passover? How can you celebrate the resurrection a month before Jesus died? If we celebrated his death as the New Testament tells us to, and we do it only on the day God tells us to, we would celebrate his resurrection at the correct time. People may say, what difference does it make? Ask your spouse if you can celebrate your anniversary or his birthday or her birthday on the wrong day every year and see what he or she thinks. The bigger problem is that we don't know what we don't know. If you don't realize there's a pattern, you will easily be caught unaware. So this next portion is called Jewish versus, versus uh, Greco-Roman thought. Historically, how did the church get off the biblical pattern? Sadly, it was mostly due to anti-Semitism. The early church fathers wanted nothing to do with anything that even hinted of anything Jewish. They didn't realize the Jewish calendar was biblical. Constantine took the church completely off the biblical calendar and put it on the pagan Roman calendar, and we have been stuck there ever since. So when you hear people say that our holidays are rooted in paganism, I don't believe that that's wrong because we just read it just now saying that it's true. Um, so to continue on, many are convinced that biblical history and prophecy have to be looked at from a Greco-Roman mindset rather than a Hebrew mindset. They see prophecy as a checklist of events that happen once and are considered fulfilled rather than something that would be repeated on different levels. I talked about this in my last video on this book. I'll discuss this more in depth in later chapters, but the early church fathers thinking was rooted in Greek philosophy rather than the Hebrew scriptures because that was all they knew. The co to complicate things, some of the Jewish laws were intertwined with biblical laws, and consequently, the baby would often be thrown out with the bathwater. The animosity between Jews and Gentiles was felt both ways for the most part. Neither group had a corner on righteousness. Unlike their Greco-Roman Greco mindset, according to the Hebrew mindset, that which has happened before will happen again. And then it says, see Ecclesiastes 1.9. Jewish thinking believes prophecies have multiple fulfillments. I believe this as well. The Feast of Tabernacles, one of the fall feasts of the Lord, is an example. Notice I didn't say one of the fall feasts of the Jews. These are the Lord's feasts or appointed times. I believe the pattern of this feast was set in the Garden of Eden when God first tabernacled with man. Tabernacled with man. I, it was fulfilled when Moses built the tabernacle. It was fulfilled again when Messiah was born. It was fulfilled again in John chapter 7, and it will be fulfilled during the millennial reign. And it will be fulfilled again with the new heavens and the new earth. Each time, a different aspect comes into view. I'll be reminding you throughout this book that the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, The thing that hath been it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Sometimes when I speak about this, it's like people continually bang their heads on a wall like a robot stuck in a corner saying, does not compute. I hope to say this enough that you can get out of the stuck mode and move on. In much Christian theology, people see all the prophecies as already fulfilled not realizing there will be a round two or a round three. It is so important to realize why we need to grasp the fall feasts, in particular with more depth, because they are the prophetic shadow of what is yet to come. A famous, famous Jewish sage known as Ramban, um, Nachmanides, sorry, totally butchered that, said that the deeds of the fathers are a sign of what will happen to their children. In other words, history repeats itself. We need to put a different set of glasses on as we read the Bible, realizing why we don't learn from history, especially when it continually repeats itself. 
I firmly believe both groups see through a glass darkly and only know in part. What is important for both groups to humble themselves and take a look through the other's lens to see the whole picture. If we are to understand the sign of the signs of the times and the end of the age is given throughout the scriptures, we must understand the pattern God has set forth and rid ourselves of preconceived notions concerning them. See, that's what's good about me not knowing super tons about the end times and what it says is I'm already pretty much a clean slate, so I don't have like super preconceived notions. I have some, but not a lot. So I'm like a blank canvas and I just get to learn now. And so the other part of this is when I learn things, I always go and ask my mom because I want to make sure that I'm not being led the wrong way too. So mom, I know you watch these videos. <laughs> If any of them have some crazy stuff in them that is not true, make sure you let me know, please. Okay. Anti-Semitism within the church has caused a type of blindness within it. Too often we write off biblical events instead of seeing the patterns God is trying to reveal. A couple of examples are Hanukkah and Purim. Both, or is it Purim? I don't know. Both are very biblical and a pattern for what will happen in the last days. But too few Christians know anything about their significance. They write them off as just being Jewish events and don't even give a second thought to their prophetic significance in our day. Christians need to grasp that even Hanukkah and Purim are very biblical holidays. Both are mentioned in the Bible and have tremendous spiritual and prophetic significance regarding what happened originally and aspects will be repeated in the future. The story of Purim is found in the book of Esther. It is all about the ethnic cleansing of the Jewish people. This is repeated all throughout history, including our most recent history. Haman is much like Hitler. I'll explain more about this in later chapters. In the story of Hanukkah, Antiochus doesn't necessarily want to kill all the Jews. He just wants them all to assimilate. Of course, if they don't, they will be killed. So do you think the Antichrist will be more like Haman or Antiochus? I don't know if I'm saying Antiochus right or not. We need to understand the signs of the times and where we are, we are today, such as the historical significance of the first Zionist Congress 120 years ago, the Balfour Declaration 100 years ago, the nation of Israel resurrected on the world scene 70 years ago, the recapturing of Jerusalem 50 years ago, the advance of computers and AI, and the lawless society we live in, as it was in the days of Noah and Lot. So let's jump in and take a look at the end times from the perspective of the three different monotheistic faiths. And that is the end of chapter one. Chapter two is entitled, The Jewish View of the End Times. So, I hope that you're enjoying this as much as I am. That chapter flew by like crazy. Like, it seems like I read it and it was five minutes. It's actually been 23 minutes now. So, let me know if you're enjoying these videos. Leave a comment down below. Let me know um, which of these books you want to learn more about um, to see videos on. That way I know which ones to pick. I'm for sure doing one on the Prophecies book, but the other two that I showed you guys, please leave a comment down below. If you're enjoying these videos, give me a like, um, subscribe so you can see when these videos are uploaded. Um, my only ones that are scheduled times are my devotions that go up at 6 p.m., but the rest of these will be going up whenever I have time. So make sure you subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss a video. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening to me read these books and butcher names. We will see you in the next video and God bless.